welcome to our departmental grand rounds. I'm Christine Zalecki, a clinical professor in the department and director of clinical services in the health clinic. Today, our speaker is Dr. Nicole Roberts, and I am so pleased that she is with us today to discuss her research on emotion and functional neurological disorders. Dr. Roberts is an associate director and an associate professor of psychology in the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Arizona State University. She obtained her PhD in clinical psychology at UC Berkeley, which is where I got to know her because I was in the graduate program at the same time. That was many years ago, but even now I recall how much I admired her brilliance, her intellectual curiosity, and her wit. It was quite clear then that she would become a powerhouse in academic psychology, and sure enough, I think we'll see evidence of that today. So after she received her doctorate at UC Berkeley, she completed her pre- and postdoctoral clinical training at the Martinez VA and at the UC Davis Department of Psychiatry. She currently is a research affiliate of the Mayo Clinic and the Phoenix VA and is a licensed psychologist in the state of Arizona. As director of the Emotion, Culture, and Psychophysiology Lab at ASU, Dr. Roberts conducts research on emotion and on the cultural and biological influences that shape emotional responses. Her current research focuses on understanding emotional processes in patients with functional neurological disorders, specific, specifically psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. More broadly, her work investigates how emotional functioning is altered in patients with psychopathology and neuropathology, and how daily life stressors impact emotion regulation among individuals and couples, and how ethnicity and culture influence emotional reactivity and regulation. Her research has been published in outlets such as Epilepsy and Behavior, International Journal of Psychophysiology, Journal of Social and Personal Relationships, and Psychological Services. Her talk today is titled, Why Get Emotional? Understanding Emotion-Related Mechanisms of Functional Neurological Disorders. So, but before I turn it over to Dr. Roberts, I'll remind you that we'll have a 10 minute question and answer period at the end of the talk. So please add questions to the public chat box so that she can address those during the Q&A time. And at that time, you'll also be welcome to use the raise your hand feature to ask a question. So now Dr. Roberts, uh, you can take it from here. All right. Thank you, Dr. Zalecki. And it's an honor to be here presenting. I consider the Bay Area my affective science intellectual home. And so I'm very happy to be here, even if it's virtual. Um, and I am not looking at the chat, but Dr. Zalecki will monitor. So if you have a clarification question or anything as I go along, feel free to interrupt and let me know. So again, the title of my talk is Why Get Emotional? understanding emotion-related mechanisms of functional neurological disorders, which I'll unpack. So the phrase, why get emotional, can be a rhetorical question. Why bother getting emotional? Don't get worked up. Everything is fine. And nowadays, you'll see shirts and mugs everywhere of keep calm and psychology on, or yoga on, or whatever the case may be. Um, and I'm considering today, why get emotional as an empirical question? Are there advantages to getting emotional? especially in certain populations who might have restrictions on that otherwise. So I'll talk about what psychogenic non-epileptic seizures are, which I refer to today as PNES, and functional neurological disorders, which is the broader category I'll talk about. And I'll present two studies done in my lab on emotional reactivity in PNES, one with pictures, one where people had to relive an emotional event or several events, um, and then focus on some key findings involving shame and positive emotion that might be directions for this work. Um, and I'll talk about social and cultural considerations at the end and also throughout to the extent possible. So first, what are psychogenic non-epileptic seizures? In case you're not familiar, they superficially resemble epileptic seizures. So what happens is someone looks like they're having an epileptic seizure where they might be convulsing, flailing, seeming to lose consciousness. They'll 911 will get called, they'll be airlifted to the ER, and then they come in to get uh, EEG monitoring, which is the standard. If they're lucky, they'll get video EEG monitoring where, um, as in this photo, photo they might, um, the EEG is on. While events are captured behaviorally, usually it can take a couple of days to get this. And lo and behold, the EEG does not show any evidence of epilepsy. So 
it's purely a behavioral kind of manifestation of seizures. And we'll talk more about the mechanisms. So this is actually quite a conundrum. The reason I started studying this was because I had a neurology colleague here in Phoenix who said, you know, almost half of our patients, we, they come into the epilepsy monitoring unit, they're taking lots of time, resources, they're very distressed, and yet they don't have epilepsy. They're not responsive to anti-epileptic medication. We don't know what to do. Um, and so this is, again, a major public health conundrum. There's a lot of distress. Uh, and so it can take about seven years on average to get a diagnosis of PNES because everyone assumes they're having an epileptic seizure, can give anti-epileptic drugs on and off for years until they get the proper diagnosis and treatment. So for context, this is a normal waking EEG example from my neurology colleague. And this is an example of a primary generalized epilepsy. So quite dramatic if this activity is not present and yet someone's looking like it should be. So for years and years, this condition was considered a psychological problem that was a manifestation of hysteria um, stemming from Freudian notions of conversion disorder. Um, so psychogenic non-epileptic seizures may appear similar to epilepsy, but are caused purely by the emotions is a quote that I like as an emotion researcher, because we're able to test, is this true? And a big study of practitioners found life stressors, past abuse, trauma, anxiety, depression, were causes cited to patients, even though it was not clear if these actually were causing the seizures or not. And in fact, it, it was distressing for individuals who said, I'm not stressed, nothing is wrong, you're telling me stress is causing this bad problem, what should I do? This is compounded by the fact that most are women um, with a mean age of onset between 20 and 40. There are psychiatric comorbidities. There's often a trauma history. Sexual and childhood abuse characterizes a good proportion of patients. There's high distress, poor quality of life. So it creates the impression of a hysterical woman. And this is a huge gender and stigma issue. It's a huge social justice issue of how to treat these individuals who are suffering um, and give some sort of biopsychosocial basis to what they're experiencing versus being told that they're crazy. So non-epileptic seizures have in the past were called hysterical seizures, hysteroepilepsy, conversion seizures. They're incidents of um, epilepsy physicians slapping patients was the most extreme story I heard to try to slap them out of having this episode. And so the field has really shifted toward understanding the neurobiological underpinnings. Um, my research was among the first to look at the emotion processes in this group that we'll talk about. And so there was a, a big paper that we published this year, uh, how to do things with words based on seminars on how do you name this condition. This is still an active debate in the field, given all of the ramifications, because individuals will come to neurologists, they're pushed back to psychology. Psychologists say, I don't know how to treat this condition, go back to neurology, and folks get bounced around the system. They can't work, but yet they don't have a, a good way to explain to their coworkers, well, it's not epilepsy, but it's psychogenic seizures. So in the DSM-5 now, uh, this has been referred to under the somatic symptom category as conversion disorder, functional neurological symptom disorder, which probably most of you know if you're a psychiatrist looking at the DSM every day. And what's interesting to me is that there's actually this parenthetical statement in the DSM. So the diagnosis label is reflecting the debate in the field about how to think about this. Most people have heard of conversion disorders if they've been through their training, um, but haven't heard of functional neurological disorders yet. Right now we're about to launch a survey for providers, in fact, to assess people's knowledge of this. So one of the best definitions of a functional neurological disorder I found is from the Mayo Clinic's website, um, the simplest, that says functional neurological disorders are related to how the brain functions rather than damage to the brain's structure, such as from a stroke, multiple sclerosis, or so on. And so this is a picture, well, the colorful circles are from a picture um, from a paper where 
we thought about different constructs that might be underpinning functional neurological disorder pathophysiology. And again, the field has made amazing strides in this area just in the past few years. And the idea when I first learned about this condition seemed how very almost improbable that you're having these behavioral manifestations of these seizures and yet you're not having EEG activity. But in fact, it makes sense as you start thinking about the motor system, the emotion system, uh, the idea of agency and how if you're having behaviors, but you're not linking those to awareness or you're having an emotional uh, episode, but not linking it to an event perhaps it can look like a seizure. So for example, if you're angry and you're punching and hitting and kicking, or you're so nervous, you almost pass out and dissociate, or even if you're driving and you dissociate for a minute, all these phenomenon can happen. And if you take them in the absence of a context, you're just going about your day and suddenly this is happening, it can seem startling. But in fact, again, systems of emotion, salience, agency, what you're paying attention to within your body, what you're not aware of can come together to influence this condition. And there are many uh, models, developing neural network models of this. And so here's just one example. Um, if you're interested, David Perez has many papers looking at uh, the network underpinnings, looking at functional connectivity, um, usually the resting state functional connectivity uh, underlying PNES. And now we know that there are uh, microstructural integrity issues with PNES. Uh, so again, this is a real, a real disorder. It's not something that's in your head, but of course it's all in your head because it's the brain. So one aspect of my research uh, is how cultural and social influences uh, affect emotions and emotion regulation. And that is something else that has not really been studied in this condition that we're starting to understand. So all of these processes can get unpacked in an environmental, physical, social, cultural context. And the field is thinking about the precipitating, perpetuating factors of this disorder. And so my research focuses on emotion and I'm increasingly focusing on the bodily awareness aspect of it as a psychophysiology researcher. Um, but today I'll talk about studies that focus on uh, the emotional aspect. So there are many definitions of emotion. It's generally agreed upon that it's an adaptive multi-componential system. So I view emotions as unfolding in a social cultural context and the reaction, the re when I say emotional reactivity, I'm referring to a response to a stimulus that can be internally driven, externally driven. Even now we know the brain's predictions can influence what emotions you have and when you have them. And then regulation or the efforts to control those emotions. If I'm giving a talk live, I'll say everyone is experiencing emotions right now. And if you realize you have something to do and you're nervous about it, but you're not getting up and running out of the room to do it, or you're bored and you're not falling asleep, you're regulating in some way. Something else I've started thinking about, especially with respect to PNES, is emotional awareness and how being aware of your emotions is not only something that's this meta level process on it, but actually can shape the emotions themselves. So reactivity, regulation, awareness all act together. In the PNES literature so far, a common theme, a prominent theme, is the idea that those with PNES have hyperarousal and then they're avoiding their emotions. And so study after study tends to converge on these themes where individuals have higher basal cortisol, uh, lower respiratory sinus arrhythmia at baseline, which is less parasympathetic activation, so less calming, a lower vagal tone. Uh, and emotions are experienced as overwhelming, as interfering. Uh, those with PNES are more likely to have working memory interference or set shifting uh, interference from emotions than controls. Coupled with this idea that individuals with PNES are not aware that they're under distress or of having any kind of hyperarousal response. So often 
if you ask patients what are bothering them, they'll say, um, it's my illness. The illness is the problem. Never mind that they lost their job or had some bad trauma that they've had recent reminders of. So the population is characterized by poor emotional awareness and alexithymia or difficulty labeling feelings of themselves and others. So my work started uh, thinking about these themes and how to test them. One study that I thought was clever was um, patients had to either approach by physically moving their arms forward or avoid by physically moving their arms back a stimulus. And it was found that those with PNES versus controls would be slower to approach an anger face. And I thought, well, who would want to approach an anger face? But if you're a control subject, you're more likely than if you're not. And this was associated, this hesitance, with higher basal cortisol. However, as I'll talk about, trauma also accounted for a lot of these findings. So in my lab, um, again, I study emotion, emotional reactivity, regulation in individuals and couples. So for context, when I'm not studying those with PNES, um, we also study high stress populations, military, police officers, um, and looking at the couple and cultural relationship context, we also study sleep. And I measure emotion looking at the primary three components of self-report, subjective experience, and then behavior based on facial coding or EMG, and then physiological reactivity. And today I'll focus on the cardiovascular reactivity. So in doing this work, I was interested in understanding, is PNES actually an emotional disorder? Is it emotion that's at the heart of it? Is it a failure to process emotions? And what does that mean? So to examine this, we wanted to actually evoke emotions in the lab and not just say, oh, patients are coming in there. They have all these comorbidities, so it must be an emotion problem. Let's probe the emotion system and see, is it an emotion problem? And if so, where? Also, including clinical or trauma control groups is highly important because all of the studies I've talked about um, and the studies to date, even still, largely focus on epilepsy as the comparison group or healthy controls. So it's difficult to tease apart the comorbidities and uh, the, the problems that are due to trauma versus something unique to having PNES. So why have trauma and then have PNES versus PTSD versus both? So my work aims to tease that apart. So for our first study, we looked at responses to pictures, and this is a standard paradigm used um, throughout the world, the International Affective Picture System slides. And so you could see positive, negative, neutral stimuli here. And we looked at three groups, those who were diagnosed with PNES based on video EEG monitoring, and those high and low in post-traumatic stress disorder, symptoms based on the post-traumatic stress symptom checklist. Groups were matched. And again, the PNES patients and PTS high, I call them patients, were pretty high on distress and tended to have complex early childhood trauma. And this is published in Epilepsy and Behavior. So what we found clinically was that the PNES and PTS high groups were similar in practically every clinical dimension except somatic report with the PNES population double in terms of their perceptions of somatic symptoms that they were experiencing of headaches and shaking, that kind of thing, stomach aches. Uh, those with PNES were taking anti-epileptic medication, which often happens because they come in for their diagnosis and it's presumed they have epilepsy, so they're still on anti-epileptic drugs. So for a few, they might stay on it if they have bipolar and other a condition where it seems to be helping as a mood stabilizer, but in general, they get weaned off. But at the time that we had patients referred to us, they were still taking the anti-epileptic medication, but they did have a diagnosis. So they came to our lab, which is a unique situation because we were a neutral lab. We weren't a psychiatrist office where um, they might be concerned about coming in. We were social behavioral sciences department. So we were able to get patients to come in um, who were referred. So that helped. Uh, we attached 
sensors to measure their physiology. And then they saw the IAP slides that I mentioned and completed ratings. We also recorded behavior continuously. So I'm gonna jump to the findings. And what's interesting is that uh, counter to predictions, there was no variation in how pleasant or unpleasant they thought the slides were. We thought maybe patients would view the slides as much more unpleasant, but they didn't. So they could discriminate positive and negative. What was interesting was their experiences of intensity were a lot greater, particularly to the neutral and the pleasant slide. So this is Lang's self-assessment mannequin. Um, and so you could see with the red bars that the patients were reporting feeling more worked up inside uh, during neutral and pleasant. We also coded their facial behavior, uh, which again, has not really been done in this population. And we found that again, contrary to predictions, there were no differences in response to negative, although it's possible that with more participants, we would have higher uh, negative here. But, um, but the, the striking thing that we noticed was the reduction in positive emotional behavior. Um, in, expressive behavior, smiles and laughing in response to stimuli like cute puppies. And again, the orange bar reflects those with PTSD. So this really seems to be a deficit because these findings are even controlling for self-reported depression. In terms of RSA, so as I mentioned, also known as high frequency heart rate variability, it was lower at baseline for patients, but not compared to uh, the PTSD group. So both the PTSD and uh, PNES individuals showed lower baseline RSA. So it doesn't seem to be a unique marker for them. And the same with self-reported emotion regulation dif difficulties, self-reported. There also were no differences in cardiac interbeat intervals. So that also was a surprise to us, but other studies similarly have found there isn't necessarily the difference just in heart rate, but it's the heart rate variability you see reduced. So revisiting this idea of hyperarousal and somatic interpretation, um, the first study led to show that it's really the perhaps perceptions of arousal, where you're having a mistimed or a conditioned reaction to a neutral stimulus or a pleasant stimulus. So that's why it might seem it comes on out of the blue. And also the deficit in positive emotional expression was striking. But these and these held even with the against the matched controls. But the parasympathetic activation and emotion regulation difficulties findings um, were similar in the clinical controls. So this started indicating where the deficits might be and not just pictures, but personally meaningful emotions were important to study. Also, uh, I wanted to test whether it is in fact the case that patients have difficulty accessing their emotions. So I was curious if I said to them, think about a time you were angry, could they do that? Would it take them a long time? How successful would they be? Could they be connected to their emotions or not? So again, we studied three groups. This group was, these groups were less well-matched. So um, the PTS high, the PNES group was older, less educated, uh, more likely to be married. Although interestingly, they were as likely to be in a relationship and they were more likely to be taking some kind of psychotropic medication. So um, I'll present findings controlling for these factors. And we said, think about a time you felt neutral. We started with neutral and then we repeated counterbalance for anger, happiness, shame. Just think about it until you can picture it very clearly and then write it down on a paper in a couple of sentences. And then the experimenter left the room and we said, when you can feel it very strongly, press this button. And meanwhile, we recorded uh, physiology, uh, specifically as I'll present, uh, heart rate, heart rate variability, and we recorded their behavior continuously. Um, and then they had to do post, and then they had to talk about it out loud. And so we have a lot of qualitative data we've started to code and then fill out some ratings. And just to give you an example, this is a, a well-used task where um, the, the prompt for neutral was to think about a routine. And I have some, an example I wanted to read to you from a PNES participant. So we said, think about a, a normal everyday routine, like something you do every day of laundry, driving to work, chores. 
So this person said, doing laundry used to be one of the chores I hated as a child, except the times when I could play around with it. Now I like to keep the laundry so that it is never out of order. So kind of neutral, but talking about something you hated isn't necessarily so neutral after all. Um, and these are the, uh, in parentheses, are the prototypical antecedents for these emotions. But we didn't prompt with those unless they were having trouble. Um, so like a happiness example was I felt happy when I returned to my hometown. I was able to see people who knew my mom and siblings who have passed away and was able to introduce my children to them. So happy, reuniting, but also tinged with negativity. Um, and then for anger and shame, there were pretty powerful events, um, everything from watching something be stolen and feeling bad about it to alcohol or drug use in the past, an addiction that they felt ashamed of, um, to watching family members uh, hurt themselves and those being very shameful. So pretty powerful events that they wrote out. Then when it came time to actually doing the task, um, we asked how much emotion did you feel just now while reliving that experience? So this is a bubble plot where you can see the individual participants. Since we only had 11, we thought it was important to show the, uh, the scope. And this is published also from 2020. And so the black horizontal lines are the, the mean for that emotion. Um, and the bigger bubbles show more participants responded at that rating. So what was interesting was when we asked how much emotion did you feel just now, there were no group differences. Everybody felt more anger and shame uh, than neutral, as you can see by these mean ratings, they felt a little bit more happiness. Um, so this is our manipulation check, it worked. And again, for the PNES patients, we had competing hypotheses, alternate hypotheses. One was that they would report less of everything as an avoidance um, and disconnect. And one would be that they would report more as a hyperreactivity kind of model. Um, but what's more interesting is that when we asked how difficult it was to relive that experience, there were group differences. So everyone felt that reliving anger and shame was more difficult than reliving neutral and happy. And again, in our society, and for most people, they'd rather feel positive emotions. That's not always the case, but in general, that's what makes people feel better subjectively. So they're aiming for that. So when you say, think of a time you felt ashamed and talk about it, it's difficult for everyone. But for those with PNES, it was even more difficult. And these are the people who completed the task and a few didn't, which I'll mention. And anger also was difficult. So when we controlled for those demographic and psychiatric group differences, like differences in anxiety and depression, PNES reported even more difficulty than the PTS high group. If you look at the heart rate variability, so this graph is oriented a little bit different where we have the three groups here. And then these are three time points of thinking about the event, talking about the event and recovering after having just had talked about the event. Um, so these are changes from the resting baseline. And what's interesting here is that um, PNES, uh, those with PNES showed decreases from this mean line when reliving happiness, whereas controls showed increases. And so there were no differences in RSA during the task um, for the negative emotions. So we're starting to see the consistent theme of it's negative, everyone feels badly, um, physiological arousal is consistent across groups. But when it comes to uh, a positive event, think about a time you felt happy, uh, controls showed better vagal regulation, more re physiological relaxation, whereas for those with PNES, it actually got worse. Um, and this graph are the uncorrected means. So once we adjusted for the covariates, it actually was during the rest condition that those with PNES continued to show these decreases from baseline, whereas the other groups, even the PTS high, showed increases. So they're not physiologically um, engaging in a positive, calm way with happiness, 
and that is sustaining even after they're not they're still feeling um, negative perhaps uh, in terms of their regulation also most interesting to me was that three of the 11 did not even engage in the relive shame task and had a PNES episode in the lab. As we told our participants, we are not trying to induce a seizure. That's not our goal. Um, but if it happens, then at least we're in a position to know what were the circumstances. And so uh, they felt it was too difficult. They couldn't generate an event um, or they just froze after the writing portion and had a catatonic type of state. And I didn't mention this at the beginning, but in addition to the overt flailing type of seizure that might seem tonic clonic like, uh, there also are the dissociative catatonic type of PNES episodes. And in fact, uh, in the ICD manual, it talks about uh, PNES as a dissociative seizure. One could not generate an anger event. They said they've never been angry. They've been mildly annoyed at times, never angry. Um, and one had a PNES episode during the neutral when she was painstakingly describing uh, a chore or her morning routine and how she makes a sandwich. She kind of got slower and slower as she described it until she ended up having kind of a catatonic slumping episode. All the controls completed all tasks, including those with pretty high PTSD symptom levels. So this raises the question of why they're why this is happening. Are they overwhelmed? Are they blocked? Are they avoiding? What's going on? Um, and because I did the phone screens, I knew they all did have upsetting events. So it's interesting that then they couldn't relive them. I had a separate research assistant who was the experimenter, so they were blind to condition. So this study uh, revealed that reliving emotions is in fact more effortful. Emotional disengagement occurs even versus clinical controls. And perhaps positive emotion is not as restorative, um, showing the RSA decreases versus increases. And so I'm gonna unpack these a little bit more. And so recently we published two papers um, with Marcus Reuber, who's at Sheffield, uh, looking at the role of shame. And uh, one of the papers has the title, The Elephant in the Room, and it's focused on treatment. Lorna Myers is the first author. And for anyone who is a clinician, shame is something that is present, but might not get overtly talked about. Uh, and so we were wondering if shame had a special role, given that in our task, it was during the shame condition that three of the 11 couldn't continue, whereas they could even for anger, happiness. And so in thinking about shame, what's interesting is it has it involves a number of processes that are also thought to be implicated in PNES, namely having a self-referential process where you have to be aware of yourself. You have to be aware of culture, social norms. Um, and so some of the even neurobiology underlying shame, involvement of the insula, uh, also is involved in interoception. So it's possible that shame and its experience or the need to avoid that experience is also related to having poor interoception, lack of agency, social withdrawal. So some of the key mechanisms that are hypothesized as being problematic in PNES. So again, this work is just starting and um, speculative, but I think it's a really important direction. I also think anger in itself and then the shame of feeling angry, which often happens, especially for women and people of color um, who are shamed for being angry visibly sometimes. Um, there could be two paths where anger is also uh, contributing to a triggering of the motor system shutting down in some way. And so in fact, uh, from another conceptual model, we talked about affect perhaps directly triggering a PNES if you get overwhelmed or triggering dissociation, which then triggers a PNES. So in other words, incorporating a emotion lens, I think of it as it's possible that you could have reactivity triggering the PNES, or it's 
effortful regulation. And in fact, some researchers argue you can't even separate reactivity and regulation. So the reason I present this model is because it helps explain how both a hyperarousal and an avoidance process can both either independently or simultaneously link to a PNES. And this parallels some of the PTSD literature that talks about the hypo and hyperarousal subtypes of PTSD. One of the first studies of functional connectivity also is in line with this idea. And one of my favorite explanations is that you have emotions, whether you're aware of them or not. And in normal controls, you, your emotions go through a process of cognition, and then the supplementary motor cortex can be activated, motor planning, motor actions separately. Whereas in PNES, they found stronger functional connectivity among those. So in other words, it might be that instead of having cognitive control, you have the emotions and it goes right to the motor output, which could explain why um, you don't feel like you're having an emotion and yet you're having a reaction. And why in our study, if we ask someone to think about a shame experience, they shut down, they shut off, they start having rolling in their chairs and shaking. So given these models, then the question becomes where to intervene. And psychotherapy does work for PNES. It's the treatment of choice. Um, and so one of the biggest challenges is getting people to accept the diagnosis. And I wouldn't wanna accept a diagnosis that seemed so neurological. You think you're having seizures, you you're unaware, something neurological must be going on. And so part of it is having the rapport with the patient to explain what this is and that it's not neurological, but it's not in your head and there is treatment for it. And so again, the field has been working to communicate the diagnosis effectively to patients and to study the neurobiology of it so that we can say this is something, this is something legitimate. There's a reason that this is happening, as has happened over the years with PTSD and schizophrenia. They're now legitimate biological conditions. Um, and PNES is first getting there as are all functional neurological disorders. Uh, there has been uh, a randomized clinical trial showing cognitive behavioral therapy works. It works in combination with sertraline and it works alone, better than sertraline alone, better than a control, better than treatment as usual. So cognitive behavioral therapy is the one uh, standardized treatment of choice that we know exists. And Kurt LaFrance is on the cutting edge of all of the work regarding treatment of PNES. We also know prolonged exposure works. Uh, Lorna Myers, uh, who had a PTSD therapy practice, also conducts the same practice with PNES patients. And so she gives them an hour to have a seizure. She'll do something else. And then after the hour, they either have to stop having the seizure or they leave and reschedule the session. So the, the seizures are treated like a behavior that you can, you know, ignore and then go back to the work that you were doing in an attempt to ultimately extinguish them. And the retraining and control therapy REACT is a pediatric treatment that again has just been piloted and is similar to what I mentioned in terms of trying to disconnect the seizure from your life. So you feel it coming on and like a panic attack, how can you divert and not give into it as a full-blown seizure. Uh, and I know in terms of mindfulness, which is proving very effective in a number of conditions, there's some preliminary evidence that it's effective for PNES as well. And Bezlet has published an, a an initial uncontrolled trial and then some follow-up with the work suggesting that the mindfulness components can help. So the treatment recommendations based on our work, and of course, not just our work, but this that strikes me when I look at our patterns of findings um, is the idea of experiential avoidance. And so based on some preliminary survey data I have, 
it really is the avoidance and not emotion suppression per se that's associated with seizure frequency and severity. And the literature is mixed with some researchers finding self-reported suppression and others not as significant in relating to seizure outcomes. But in our work, it's, it's the avoidance that's the issue. Also unpacking the idea of what is neutral, because there can be a lot of conditioned learning going on, as we know, and this is really important because, again, explanations of telling someone you're having a stress seizure and they're not experiencing stress or they're having the seizure when they're relaxing doesn't make sense unless you look at it from the perspective of they're having an overreaction to what others would perceive as neutral. And this is starting to get found more and more with other disorders of bipolar and PTSD, ADHD, where you're looking at a neutral face and you're reading into it as angry or aggressive or you're getting more triggered than other people might in terms of your perceptions of it. So that may be happening here too. Upregulating positive emotion. So again, if someone comes in and they're in such distress, the first thing you may not think about is, well, how can we bring more positivity to you? Um, of course, people in this group are thinking about that. And so we extend that. And then considering the social and cultural context and intersectionality. And so I'm gonna talk about these latter two in the remaining time we have. So revisiting that initial model with the circles and thinking about the social environment. Um, again, I study couples and relationships and my master's student who's now in a PhD program did her thesis, her master's thesis, looking at positive emotion and affection in those with PNES and their partners um, and how that might link to emotional awareness and somatic symptoms. Because if the idea with PNES is that you're interpreting your feelings in a somatic way, you're interpreting your arousal, not as an emotion. Oh, it's not that I'm angry. It's just my stomach hurts, which again is common and we see across disorders, but there seems to be a unique component here where that's actually really central to the psychopathology. Um, so there's also a huge literature, my colleague, Mary Burleson, um, we've co-published on involving affectionate touch and how that can also be related to interoception. And so putting it all together, so far we're finding that those with PNES have less positive emotion, they have less affectionate touch in their relationships, even if they're equally satisfied in those relationships. Um, and this is related to not having emotional awareness, to having more somatic symptoms. So this could be a key component. And again, we have an ongoing survey that includes patients and their partners so we can understand their social relationships more. And then in terms of culture, there are all these ways that culture can influence the perception of symptoms, your responses to stress, your acceptance of treatment, and uh, PNES is found around the world, and the symptom presentation tends to be fairly similar. Sometimes the age of onset differs, uh, but in general, it's consistent. If you're looking at um, papers that have published Brazil, uh, China, Georgia as the, the country, so in different places in Africa, you, you see this everywhere. And the the main issue is getting access to treatment, because at least in Western countries, industrialized countries, as long as it takes to get the diagnosis, it still is faster than in countries that don't have uh, video EEG monitoring. If people have technology, I went to a talk by a neurologist who said the best tool is for someone to use their phone because they can capture the seizure. If they can turn on their phone and capture the seizure, someone can look and try to get a sense of whether it's non-epileptic or epileptic at least based on the behavior and the history, even without that video EEG monitoring. Um, but, it, but this is a, a major challenge. So my work has looked at beliefs about emotion and specifically a construct called emotion control values. And that's how important do you feel it is to control your emotions or not? Do you think in day-to-day -day life you should? Should you be open and express all your feelings? So our preliminary survey results suggest that you have greater emotion control values. You feel you should control your emotion more if you're of ethnic minority status. And we didn't have enough 
uh, subjects to really tease this apart, which is why I'm not presenting it as a full study. But if you combine into white and non-white participants, those of minority status reported higher ECV. Um, and higher ECV, feeling you have to control your emotions more, was linked um, with worse emotional awareness, worse emotion regulation. It wasn't linked, though, with PNES symptoms. So the intersectionality component I mentioned that's important could be that you have two processes coming in. Maybe you're experientially avoidant for reasons related to your PNES. Maybe you also feel that you have to control your emotions because of gender or culture reasons. And so those two processes might be acting in parallel. So in treatment, it would be important to target both, even if they're not um, intersecting in our data in terms of um, an interaction effect. But again, we have an online survey that's ongoing for patients and partners where we're we have people participating from all around the world, which is the benefit of social media. And uh, there's an organization called FND Hope that has uh, databases where people can participate in studies. You can recruit participants. So we have a global um, population in our studies, but yet the participants themselves um, are mostly white, even if they're international. So we, what we want to look at is cultural variation within the U.S. and then globally and and see what we can find in terms of these emotion processes and emotion beliefs and how they might be playing into PNES. Um, we're also moving toward doing experience sampling and physiological monitoring, trying out um, instead of laboratory-based tests, things like even Fitbits, which we're doing with our police officers to try to understand how do the day-to-day -day fluctuations influence your perceptions of emotions and what are the cumulative effects over time? Are your emotions building and building in a way that could lead to having a non-epileptic event? Also the idea of how your awareness of your emotions connects with your ability to regulate. And again, we know clinically and in a lot of research that being aware and labeling your feelings can actually help serve as a form of emotion regulation but testing it in this population to see when and how that occurs. Um, and again, looking at your partner relationships, social and cultural contexts are gonna be key to see how the behaviors play out. And ultimately, returning to the title of my talk, finding ways to safely and constructively get emotional. So with that, I will thank my collaborators and mentors and we will have time for questions. All right, so we do have some questions uh, in the chat box, but in addition, if anyone would like to ask a question or a comment, you can use the reactions button and the kind of raise hand. So let me take a look at the chat box here. So I can see you... someone at, oh, sorry. Oh, I, there's a question about attachment and attachment disorders. Um, and this is definitely relevant. Again, David Perez has some papers on this. And the uh, you do see relationships between attachment avoidance, attachment anxiety, and PNES in the ways that you might expect, as in PTSD. Um, because there are such high proportions of individuals with trauma, it's hard to know if the problems are trauma related or not. So new studies are starting to look at PTSD plus PNES versus PNES alone to begin to tease that apart. Um, we did collect attachment, personality, the interpersonal circumplex. So those are next on our list to analyze, especially in conjunction with the affectionate touch data. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so there was a, a question that came just to me from Dr. Rose, wondering if you use ACEs, oh, if you've used or have thought about ACEs and um, Korg's um, polyvagal theory. Yeah, yeah, so from, um, so again, starting out, I mistakenly thought, well, we know that trauma is involved in this condition. So I didn't do as thorough of a trauma assessment as I should have early on, and now we do. And so in our sample, it's 
like all but one person from our lab sample has had early childhood trauma. So it's quite prevalent. And um, it could be a referral bias of the people going to the clinics and getting the treatment and coming to us, but the larger population also suggests. So that is a huge piece of it. Um, and then uh, in our global online survey, we're seeing a little bit less of that. So the people who are self-reported that they have this condition, um, we have about 10 people in that sample who haven't had trauma. So, uh, but in our sample, it's pretty high and they're mostly um, adverse childhood events. And so I don't know if that's, if there's something more specific about the condition in that, but, but yes and yes to that being really relevant. Um, and then for Portis's polyvagal theory, um, so the RSA data are complicated because you have baseline and then you have how does RSA respond uh, or what are RSA changes and respond to a task? So I conceptualize RSA as being an index of uh, regulation, but then also effort. And it's hard to tease those apart. So if you're doing a difficult task, you might expect RSA to increase because you're trying to put forth more effort. So there's some research that suggests that. Um, but so far, what we're seeing is it's the baseline that is the problem. They're coming in with, in general, low RSA, and it's staying that way throughout tasks. We didn't see RSA differences from one task to the next, except for the happiness findings I showed versus control. So, um, so again, if whoever asked the question had something more specific about what they're thinking in terms of theorizing, I'd be happy to hear more. All right. Um, yeah, I think so. And, and Descartes, I think you had your hand raised. Can we unmute? Yeah. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for this wonderful, very thought provoking talk. I, and I feel like I'm asking you a question that would be the basis of another grand rounds as opposed to something you could just answer now. But I'm going to ask it anyways, which is, um, uh, you know, I heard that there's some relationship, and I, I think I've read some things, but it's been a long time now, about the relationship between functional neurological disorders and hypnotizability and suggestibility. And it gets at the issue of agency that you mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. So I'm just going to ask you to like comments or thoughts on, on, on that. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting that um, those with PNES are more susceptible. And in fact, I, I met someone, I had done a sabbatical and I was in Germany and I met someone who had worked with hundreds of PNES patients and he was the go-to guy to induce the seizure because he would tell them this cotton ball has something that's going to make you, you know, have a seizure. And then he would like put it on their neck and he could get almost 100% of those with PNES to have the seizure, which they needed so they could collect the EEG so they could confirm the diagnosis. Because um, one thing I didn't mention is about 10% of those with PNES also have epilepsy. And so I can talk more about that relationship. But, but yes, yeah, so hypnotizability um, and suggestibility is found in this population versus in, it's more than in epilepsy. Um, Oh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, then? please. Are there any interventions that have been shown to alter that? Can we make people more or less hypnotizable in some way without yeah. drugs, I guess? Well, I was going to say it's kind of an ethical question, but it's funny you should say about the drugs because I was at a FND workshop and, and there are people that want to start to use substances. Um, the pendulum is kind of swinging almost back to that, like from the 60s to... Uh, use drugs to be, make people more suggestible. Um, and so, so yes, I think it's kind of an ethical question um, of, I see it as in some ways the placebo effect at work, which is real. Um, and, and that's in some ways, the reason I say it's ethical, because you could keep suggesting to someone that they don't have their seizures in a way to make it go away. And I think that's what neurologists do with some of the other FNDs. So like, um, so for functional movement disorders, like there's a test, they can be like tapping and then they distract them over here 
and then, or they're tremoring and then they distract them over here and the tremor stops, which in a true tremor disorder, you wouldn't see. And so they're like, aha, you know, you don't really have it. Look, you can stop. So yeah, I think that would be an interesting topic for a whole other <laughs> grand rounds. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Roberts, there's one other um, question in the chat from, from Dr. Rose. What is the earliest age um, that this emerges? And um, well, I'll just, I'll say what the questions mm -hmm. are and you can kind of choose how to answer in, in what order. Um, what is the earliest age this emerges? Have you looked at caregiver quality? And is there any exploration? Oh, you already talked about attachment style. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, and it's starting to pop up for me too. There's a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, so I don't know the earliest age, but it can be pretty young. It's definitely in teens. And I think just as with all psychopathology, you're starting to see it earlier, like, you know, 10 years old, but I don't know what the earliest is, but it is in pediatric conditions. And so what I was going to say related to epilepsy is when there's an earlier age of onset, um, there is a trend toward having epilepsy. And then PNES overlaid or the epilepsy and then it's controlled and then the psychogenic seizures start. And so it implies either a conditioned learning kindling kind of response, um, a behavioral response. Some people argue there's like secondary gain. You have these epileptic seizures, you get the attention and then, you know, it's controlled and now what? And I'm not a fan, as most people aren't either, of the attention-seeking ex explanation of it. Um, but the idea that you know the brain has a kindling and conditioned learning effect that would lead to have epilepsy and then the psychogenic seizures makes sense. There also was a whole Time article many years ago about the mass hysteria in the Northeast of a of multiple teenage girls getting PNES. Um, so, and someone mentioned in the chat, psychoanalytic studies of psychoanalytic theory are rare. And what's interesting is because a lot of this work is done by neurologists and by European neurologists, there's less concern about invoking psychoanalytic theories. And so there are some articles now that, that bridge the gap and, and show how some of these conversion notions um, of hysteria can now be substantiated neurally, but in more pointed ways. So thinking about interoception and agency and rather than thinking about it like the id and the ego. Um, and caregivers. So uh, I was, there's a new, there aren't a ton of studies on caregivers, but I read a paper that's interesting looking at socioeconomic differences by Dan Drain um, and that caregivers had different responses at the high and low socio economic points. So caregiver responses to PNES can differ, but they were mostly women caring for women. And, and in our data too, you'll see a lot of moms caring for their, you know, you'll see like 67 year old moms caring for their, you know, 30 year old daughters who come in with PNES. So the caregiver is often like a parent or a sibling in addition to spouses who come in. Right, maybe one last question as we're, we're wrapping up. Is the relationship between the expressiveness of the culture and the frequency of PNES? Oh, I would love to study that. Um, and the idea would be if you're in a more expressive culture, whether it's, you know, African-American South or I call it New York East Coast Bay Area psychotherapy culture where you believe in expressing your emotions, um, versus a very like tempered, moderate culture. You would think you would see a difference. So far we haven't, I keep hoping my data are going to cooperate where you're gonna have emotion control values leading to <laughs> suppression, leading to outcomes. And so far it's not working like that, but um, I'm collecting more and hopefully more data and hopefully it will. So far around the world, it's not quite mapping on like that, but I'm still really interested in teasing that apart. Well, thank you again so much for a really wonderful and informative presentation. Thank you. And feel free. Um, I know there's a lot of questions I didn't get to answer. Feel free to email me directly or um, 
go through Dr. Selecki or Gina Martinez to, to can address those. Thank, Thank you so much. All right.